I'm Rob Witcher from Destination Certification, and we're here to help you pass the CISSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major malware and anti-malware topics in Domain 7 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the third of six videos for Domain 7. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. These mind map videos are one part of our complete CISSP masterclass. Let's start by defining malware. Malware is any software that is intentionally written to do something malicious or harmful to a system, network, device, etc. Malware is the encompassing term for all the different types of malicious software we're about to talk about. I'm going to provide you with very concise definitions of the characteristics of each type of malware. And keep in mind that it is not uncommon for a piece of malicious software to exhibit one or more of these characteristics out in the wild. But just remember these simple definitions for the exam. A virus is a piece of malware that must be triggered by the user. Worms are self-propagating as they can discover a vulnerable system, exploit the vulnerability, infect the system, and begin the process again of discovering new vulnerable systems. This allows worms to potentially spread extremely rapidly because they can self-propagate. A companion does not modify a file. Rather, it creates a new file with a similar name to a commonly executed file and relies on the user accidentally executing this new malicious file. Macro malware are malicious code written in macro languages like, say, VBScript for Microsoft Excel. The macro code runs within an application like Excel, which is why you get such dire warnings about app opening a macro-enabled spreadsheet from, say, an email or that you downloaded off the internet. Multipartite is a piece of malware that spreads in multiple different ways. Think Stuxnet. It first infected via a USB stick using a USB vulnerability, and then Stuxnet spread over the local area network using a network-based vulnerability. Polymorphic malware can change or morph characteristics about itself to evade detection, primarily by signature-based anti-malware scanners, which we'll talk about soon. Trojans mislead users of their true intent, they are disguised as legitimate software the user would want, but they actually contain malicious code. A botnet is not a piece of malicious software, but rather multiple systems that have been infected, allowing the systems to be remotely commanded and controlled. When harnessed together, botnets of hundreds, thousands, or even millions of machines can send vast amounts of spam, perform distributed denial of service attacks, or mine for cryptocurrency. A boot sector infector is a type of malware that copies itself into the boot sector or master boot record of a hard drive. The malware can then run when the system is booted or started, long before any anti-malware software or any other security measures are running. This is what makes boot sector infectors particularly difficult to detect and remove. Hoaxes and pranks are forms of social engineering, not code. Hoaxes are meant to be harmful, whereas pranks are just for fun. Logic bombs are malware that are triggered by a certain logic or condition being met. The type of day, the day of the year, if an employee is still in the HR database, if a piece of code is running within a sandbox, etc. Stealth is malware that is specifically designed to actively disable the security tools on a system and therefore not be detected. For example, stealth malware could disable the anti-malware software or the host-based IDS on a system. Ransomware is malware that is designed to deny access to systems or files, usually by encrypting them until a ransom is paid typically via Bitcoin. Rootkits are malware that infect the operating system of a computer. The most nefarious rootkits are known as kernel mode rootkits, which, as the name implies, allows the malware to compromise the system kernel, the heart, the core of the operating system, and gain privileged access, making rootkits exceedingly difficult to detect and remove. Spyware is malware that allows an attacker to gain information about a system, to spy on it, and adware causes all sorts of pop-up advertisements. Finally, data diddlers. This is malware specifically designed to diddle with data, to, to make small changes to the data over a long period of time to evade detection. A type of data diddler is a salami attack, which specifically targets financial transactions. For example, shaving off fractions of a penny from many different transactions. That's a salami attack, a type of data diddler. A zero day is a vulnerability in a system that is first unknown to the defenders, those that would patch or configure the system to protect it. 
zero days are particularly dangerous because there are flaws that are being exploited before anyone knows to detect and remediate the vulnerability. Now let's talk about how we can prevent, detect, and defend our systems against various types of malware. We first need a policy that states that we need anti-malware systems, clearly defines roles and responsibilities for users, and training and awareness for them. Why training and awareness? As I mentioned, a virus must be triggered by a user. So one form of anti-malware is not actually systems or technology, but rather making our users aware of what malware is and training them not to open those macro-enabled Excel files that a stranger sends them. Ideally, we want to prevent malware from infecting our systems. One method of doing so is allow lists, historically referred to as whitelists. The idea here is we create a list of programs that are allowed to run on the system, an allow list. And any software that is not on the list, like say malware, is not allowed to be installed and executed on the system. Allow lists are a very good way of locking down a system and trying to prevent malware. Network segmentation is about separating our network into segments and then controlling the flow of traffic between segments, potentially preventing the spread of malware like worms. Now, in the less ideal situation that we haven't prevented malware from getting on a system, let's talk about how we can detect malware. The type of malware scanner most commonly used to detect malware are signature-based scanners. Signatures define unique patterns for a piece of malware. Anti-malware vendors are constantly looking for the latest, greatest malware, and whenever they discover something new, they write a new signature to identify the malware. And then, when their customers update their scanners, they will download the latest and greatest signatures. Signature-based scanners are fast and efficient, which is why they're so pervasively used. However, they have a significant weakness. They can only detect what they have signatures for, which means they are extremely unlikely to be able to detect zero-day malware. This is why we also have heuristic scanners. Heuristic scanners do not use signatures. Rather, they evaluate a piece of software to try to determine if it is malicious. They do this in a couple of different ways. Static heuristics analysis, which is where the static source code is analyzed, and dynamic heuristics is where a program is run in a sandbox environment and monitored to see if it does anything suspicious. Heuristic scanners are very susceptible to false positives, but they have the very big advantage of potentially being able to identify zero-day malware. Activity monitors look at running processes on a system, running programs. Activity monitors are very much a last line of defense, as the malware will need to have installed itself and be currently running for an activity monitor to detect it. But defense in depth it may be a good idea to have an activity monitor. And change detection. A lot of malware will make changes to certain system files, like configuration files. Change detection is all about monitoring key system files for changes. So we hash the files we want to monitor for changes and then rehash the files periodically to check to see if the hash values differ. If they do, it means a change has been made to the file and we may have some malware on our system. Finally, as I mentioned, most anti-malware solutions are signature-based, which means it is critically important that we constantly, continuously update our scanners with the latest, greatest signatures so we can detect the latest, greatest malware. All right, that is an overview of malware within Domain 7, covering the most critical concepts you need to know for the exam. We've written thousands of excellent CISSP practice questions and built them into our own CISSP app, along with detailed explanations to help you learn. And best of all, our app is currently free. <laughs> Can't beat that. Good CISP practice questions for free. Link to download our app are in the description below. Mm -hmm.